So welcome to the, uh, the keynote session for today. So it's really great to have uh, John Helliwell from University of Manchester. So John, of course, is known to many of us in the CCP4 community uh, for many contributions to the study weekend and more broadly in the discipline for, for many years. And recently he's become very involved in international efforts to sort of standardize and, and look at the best way to, to deal with the deposition and retention and formatting of raw data from the experiments that we're doing in order to, to make that available in a way that's, that's fair, which is an acronym I'm sure he'll explain a little bit later. So I'm very pleased to hand over to you now, John, for the keynote today. Well, thank you very much, Mike, and uh, hello everyone. Um, it's great to be able to contribute to this wonderful meeting and, and really hearty congratulations to the organizers um, for really an action-packed uh, program and all, all the speakers uh, I've enjoyed everything enormously. Now this title, a um, bit like um, other colleagues Elspeth and Eleanor uh, and, and maybe others, um, is what I distilled from um, the instructions that came in the invitation letter. Um, so uh, here it is, uh, we would like to suggest the following brief for your contribution uh, best practice, uh, what to do and not to do, um, suitable further topics, objectivity, bias, reproducibility, practical difficulties associated with hypothesis after research is known, not, which is the new word harking, um, and indeed the peer review system, fact and fair. So uh, first I'm just going to as Mike indicated, in, uh, explain these two acronyms that come from the wider uh, data science community. And in my role as representing the IUCR at the uh, International Council of Science Committee on Data, Core Data, um, I encountered all these um, uh, other disciplines. And within that, uh, I've done my best to represent uh, crystallography in general and I gave a talk um, on uh, fact and fair with big data um, in the ACA 2019 Covington Kentucky uh, meeting which I wrote up in this article. Now fact is an, an acronym used in social sciences for its data um, which they declare should be fair, accurate, confidential and transparent. The meaning for them of confidential is, is that a lot of the data um, involves uh, personal data that doesn't apply to us. Uh, but when it comes to peer review, then it does apply and, and uh, FACT has within it uh, the FAIR acronym and FAIR, um, again, a very wide, even more widely used acronym, uh, means that the data should be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And crystallography for many decades, you know, the community has built up terrific achievements in uh, making data uh, available um, and linking it with its publications. Um, and so we're probably equal to the astronomers in, in uh, being highly regarded by other uh, scientific uh, fields. And the big data, um, we are big data with our raw data. Um, but we, we're not really in the massive data league, um, but the rates of data measurement um, are increasing um, all the time with better detectors and better uh, sources of different types. Um, and so um, we are really pushing the envelope of, of what we can cope with. Um, but the um, I want to develop from the ACA uh, Kentucky talk, um, and, and beg your forbearance to, to refer you to the article in Structural Dynamics and develop the, the theme more um, and with a bit of an eye on the Act of Christ, the Proceedings paper that um, will be uh, from this talk and, and which is indeed ready for submission. Now, in the machine learning field, um, and there are great specialists uh, here, uh, they will know this, but m maybe not so familiar to others, that the raw data is our ground truth. Um, and so I'm going to, to 
uh, touch base on that. And the question uh, about best practice, um, is there really a, a unique best practice? Um, and I would um, say that actually um, we, we have a variance and I'm going to explore what that means and, and uh, the different sources of variance and we, and we need to accept that as reality. Uh, but how big a variance is okay and is it study dependent? Um, and I think you probably guessed the likely answer uh, is it is uh, study dependent. But journal editors uh, really do have a key role in deciding versions of record as gatekeepers uh, of and, and what is allowed to be that moment of the historical uh, record of the science. Now, workflows um, are increasingly diverse and um, even more than ever must be detailed carefully in explaining what we have done. And there was a, a busy CTP4 bulletin board um, discussion um, which Dale Tronrood uh, was firmly involved with and I joined in and uh, Rob Nichols and, and um, I'll go into that a bit. Um, uh, and overall, within the context, and of course, I'm very much interested in, in instrumentation and different probes of structure of matter. Um, and so the role of that in our workflows, I think, is important to explore. So if we look at the so-called big data pyramid, um, then at the base, we have our raw experimental data, the ground truth, and it's at the base of the pyramid because the data files are, are, are large. And our processed diffraction uh, data, uh, from which we derive our molecular models, gradually in involve all these decisions that we make. And then we, we uh, write our science article narrative. And of course, you then proceed from, from our most objective place, the raw data as ground truth, steadily through various decision making to uh, subjective uh, and the most subjective is, is our narrative and our presentation. Um, and of course Bernard Rupp uh, really uh, gave a great talk explaining uh, aspects of this in, in much more detail than I can give it today. But within the objectivity base here, I've got a little pound sign um, that there is remains a bit of subjectivity in what we do because an instrument must be calibrated by a person and this uh, leaves, as I say, some degree of subjectivity. Now we used to publish workflow details like this um, and I'm doing a bit of old timer moment here, um, but you know, we put into the main text and not just the supplementary, the stages of our uh, refinement. Um, and we'd talk about what we do at different rounds and we'd uh, expand uh, the uh, resolution limit. And we uh, look at the number of reflections and what's happening with our uh, R3 and the number of waters we're gradually uh, adding. Uh, and then we'll go anisotropic um, and so on and so forth. Now, this level of, of detail, um, I mean, we, we wouldn't be able to get this into the main text and, and perhaps it's too boring. Um, but on the other hand, it, it's details which the reader, um, you know, will look at with comfort, at, at feeling confident in what we're explaining in terms of our procedures. Now, of course, the basis for trust and this word provenance is very important. And th this is core to defining best practice. Um, and so there must be for best practice, trust in the crystallography, and that means the articles, the database entries and the data sets, and trust in the process. Um, and so that the metadata for the experiment and uh, the workflows for deriving the model are paramount. And in terms of metadata for raw data, I, I recall John Westbrook stressing to me the importance of this in one of our early uh, workshops for the IUCR diffraction data deposition working group. Um, and it really is a great loss to the community as Gerard uh, mentioned as well in his talk that we've lost John Westbrook recently. Now in terms of trust in the measurement at source, um, then uh, if, if we provide our raw diffraction data, um, then that's uh, the ground truth level of trust. And we can't do better than that really. Um, and, and so that's why I'm so enthusiastic about it, if we can do it. And of course, 
with all of this, um, the, the readers of our studies can reproduce the study. They know what we've done, they've got the data, they've got their narrative and, and how we've approached it. And if they can reproduce what we've done, then they can design their own studies to uh, see if it replicates. And so the US National Academy of Science, Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, uh, have got this really good report that they published in 2019. And if you register at their website, you can get a green open access uh, copy of their reports for free. But this is a really terrific, uh, very clear document that, that they produced. So we make our diffraction uh, measurements. Now, what ensures diffraction data quality in a good derived molecular model? Well, it, it's taking Coles to Newcastle a bit, this, but uh, just to say that the, the steps are we, we want a well diffracting crystal to high angle and uh, isotropic in all three directions. We want a well calibrated instrument and an experienced crystallographer and we're all conscientious we, we're here learning and keeping ourselves up to date by attending the study weekend and really you would say well there are no automatic situations and yet of course um, chemical and biological crystallography are often treated as automatic today in terms like pipeline or software black box are used and sometimes particularly uh, the case for chemical crystallography situations not biological um, in field, but the crystallographer might be mentioned in the acknowledgement or not at all. And that, that's um, a professional etiquette and ethics uh, problem that chemical crystallographers can face. And of course, machine learning and artificial intelligence are being uh, evaluated. Now, in terms of uh, a grand diagram, um, I labored over this one, um, which is to, to show you uh, the uh, sort of uh, routes that we take and, and there are other programs that I've listed here. Uh, and I apologize to those that I've not included and, and they certainly deserve inclusion. Um, but we start with our different probes and as Dorothea explained splendidly, we got the X-ray, the neutron, the electron as probe and, and our appropriate detector. And then the facility increasingly of these days provides the data archive for the uh, calibrated raw diffraction data. And at that point, I think we can properly declare this is a historical version of record in itself. And of course the files um, reached gigabytes or even terabytes on the, the X-ray laser. Uh, uh, data and, and Philip Meyer in Uppsala is providing a, a, an archive for, for X-ray laser terabyte level of, of files uh, storage. And then we have our uh, chosen uh, data reduction programs for the, uh, the int uh, diffraction intensities. And then we have our model refinement. We have our links to our favorite journals. Um, I, I allow myself the uh, li li listing the IUCR one since I was editor in chief for nine years. I'm very pleased to have been associated with these. Uh, but there are, you know, obviously other journals that, that we use. And the PDB, of course, um, with the validation reports and providing open access for uh, use and uh, uploading uh, of data is an absolutely splendid thing. And you know, with the PDB 50th, it was great to mark that so um, strongly at the IUCR Congress in Prague recently and at numerous other meetings. And so we have these uh, other moments of, of recording the historical versions of record uh, of the uh, narrative, the coordinates and the structure factors. And it was witnessing the chemical crystallographers as editor-in-chief of uh, IUCR journals that I saw how um, they uh, did this. And Professor Sid Hall from Perth in Australia and, and the daily efforts of my wife and colleague, Dr. Madeline Helliwell, um, in making sure that uh, before acceptance, everything uh, made sense with respect to the best possible uh, model coordinates from the diffraction data. Uh, and the so-called CHECKSIF is the equivalent in chemical crystallography of the PDB uh, validation report. So we have the, the, these uh, very important um, 
moments in, in history um, on a given study. Now that's not to say that pro, uh, methods uh, improve, they do, and, and that's why it's import, so important with the PDB redo uh, project that keeps track of um, the, the changes and, and able to, to allow us to evaluate um, those historical moment records and what they would be years uh, later. Now, the last 40 years has seen a particularly uh, uh, strong evolution of, of detectors. And, and to go back to the late and great Michael Rossman, famous Rhino virus as a film diffraction example, um, we strived um, right from the, the early days of, of um, the, the different um, synchron sources and, and the efforts at, at Darsbury uh, SRS were, were, were similar. So we have here the, the, the collaboration we had with the Rutherford lab for the multi-wire proportional chamber and, and the example diffraction uh, pattern. The uh, MRC LMB um, with NRAP Nodius and Uli Arndt's uh, television fast detector. And here it is at the SRS in 1984. And I've worked with Rigaku uh, with the image plates. Um, he was about 1986 and the MBL Hamburg, Jules Hendricks, very active with detector development. And this is his device, which is spun out into a, comp a company. And the Princeton detector group um, Sol Gruner uh, took his CCD to chess at Cornell, and this was a, a very important device. And here I am um, on sabbatic uh, in 1994, and, and that's measuring the data that I showed the uh, workflow example at the beginning of, of the talk. The limited uh, aperture of the CCD was overcome with the, um, the uh, tiled arrangement. Here's the three by three argon Westbrook and Nade uh, detector. And at the SRF, Jean-Pierre Moy uh, developed uh, the image intensifier system there. And we use that on ID9 at the SRF to do the time resolved diffraction um, on this enzyme uh, with a flow cell feeding substrate to the crystal. So this um, provided a, an incredible diversity uh, of instrumentation, but it, it was a, a steady evolution. Um, and we were guided by best practice on the measurement physics. And it showed us uh, what we could strive for um, in terms of trying to make the best possible um, uh, of all the technologies available. And so if we look at the um, ideal detector, on this uh, simplified plot, we've got the uncertainty in percentage and the number of X-ray photons in a diffraction spot. What we're looking for is an ideal detector that has a detector quantum efficiency of one. And we mean by that no noise is added by the detector. And that would mean if we achieve it, that 10,000 photons would make a 1% uncertainty. But as the uh, spot intensities get weaker, then we get prone to different noise contributions from the detector and it's less problematic at high intensity spots but it's very problematic at the weaker spots and of course that uh, we know is so important for what we can do with getting the uh, best diffraction resolution out of our crystal. Now if we take a practical example and this was done by the, the, the head of the detector group at Darsbury, Rob Lewis, um, he compared um, the proportional chamber as a photon counter with the image plates. And this is a rat tail collagen uh, diffraction pattern with a 10 second exposure time. And we can see the uh, proportional chamber uh, faithfully recording the diffraction pattern. The image plate is, is doing sort of okay. But if you um, reduce the exposure time by a further factor of 30, the photon counter is still giving uh, clearly the uh, linear diffraction pattern from the rat tail collagen and the image plate noise is swamping the signal. And so it was so important, this, impo this sort of measurement was so important for guiding development and striving to, to continue detector development at the, uh, and at the synchronous sources, but also for the, the home laboratory. And it became clear that the pixel detector combined all the desired electronic area detector properties. Um, and it allowed not only uh, DQE1, but it 
could cope with really high local and global count rates over a large dynamic range. And this is another slide from uh, Rob Lewis, but with collaboration of uh, Jeff Hall at Imperial College, who uh, was principally a detector physicist working with CERN, but also had as a spin-off interest uh, helping the uh, X-ray uh, beamline diffraction data uh, detection problem. But of course, PSI in Switzerland moved uh, the most expeditious, expeditiously, and not least also the spin-off in to Dectris. And so basically you, you could say that the rest is history because of course, Dectris have dominated the synchrotron X-ray beam lines uh, since then. Now, neutron um, macromolecular crystallography instrumentation has also been uh, a big interest of, of mine, um, the, the, the uh, collaborative possibilities between X-rays and neutrons um, for the application in, crystal, in protein crystallography um, seem to be clear, but the problem were always the, the technical uh, challenges and the, the, the instruments and the facilities were uh, reluctant to, to uh, get involved. But particularly driven from uh, Japan and uh, enthusiasts there, Nobuo Niyamura, and also the uh, staff at the Institute Larry Langevin, um, were witnessing what was happening both with the synchrotron lower diffraction developments um, stimulated originally uh, in, in the, the seminal work of Keith Moffat, which we joined in with enthusiastically at, at Darsbury, but also the, the uh, neutron sensitive image plates that were coming out of, of Japan from the Fuji company. And so there was uh, the steady building up of instruments as experiments uh, took off doing new neutron protein crystal structure studies in Japan and in uh, the ILL. And they uh, linked quite quickly uh, to the efforts at Oak Ridge National Lab um, and the instruments uh, there. And then the FRM2, the new reactor source in, in Germany, um, they, they um, followed the uh, monochromatic uh, image plate diffractometer of um, the uh, Japanese gyri lab, which uh, has ceased operation now, and the Japanese have, have moved into a spallation neutron uh, source at J Park with their <coughs> IBIX uh, detector. And so we have a mixture of, of uh, measuring methods here, the monochromatic, the reactor uh, quasi lowy and the time of flight lowy. And we have under development um, the uh, European spallation source uh, at uh, Lund um, and the uh, neutron macromolecular crystallography instrument led by uh, Esko Oksanen um, it is uh, so I chair the, uh, the, 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 the science and technical advisory panel. Um, and so that, that's um, under construction. And then the ISIS um, the second target station have this uh, proposed instrument, which Peter Moody is chairing the, uh, the committee uh, for uh, on behalf of the user community and, and the ISIS facility. So just as a, a glimpse of uh, the instrumentation, you saw from Lucas Gastos just in this last session, um, the uh, LADI-3 diffractometer in, in Grenoble. Um, this one on the right here um, just shows the layout of the instruments um, at the ESS in, in Lund. And uh, on the bottom right here, we've got the, the time of flight diffraction and it's a simulation. And so on the x-axis, you've got the time of flight of the diffraction spots hitting the detector. Um, and you've got the uh, specific label of the HKL index and the, the wavelength uh, of, of the neutrons. And then you've got the, on the y-axis here, you've got the detector spatial coordinate. So you can get a glimpse here of, of the benefits of the time of flight um, source because you can resolve ever larger unit cells uh, compared to the, um, the, the, the monochromatic um, or the uh, quasi Lowry reactor Lowry diffraction patterns. And so the simulations uh, here and also likewise for the oh, Ridge National Lab uh, Mandy instrument, you're looking at uh, unit cell parameters up 
to and around 200 angstrom, um, whereas the the, uh, the image plate instruments are, are around about 100 to, to 125 angstrom, appro very approximately as a guide. So, so this is, um, I, I've used this uh, word droves, um, it's perhaps a, a bit over enthusiastic, but th there's a large expansion uh, anyway, of the, the point I'm making is a large expansion of instrumentation at the neutron sources. Of course, the synchrotron uh, X-ray uh, provision of beamlines for macromolecular crystallography is, is much greater. And of course, there's the, the growing provision uh, uh, for the uh, electron uh, biological um, uh, imaging center type of approach that um, uh, as a cluster of cryo-EM microscopes has been pioneered at uh, diamond led by David Stewart um, and um, Richard Henderson and, and colleagues uh, Chris Russo at the LMB in Cambridge are uh, trying to uh, and are uh, bringing the price down of cryo uh, instruments. Um, I think he uh, gave a talk at the study weekend uh, one or two years ago. So what I've tried to do obviously quite briefly but there is a great and increasing uh, diversity of our mx analyses that are possible um, and yet an increased constraint on how much we can write in our papers about our workflows and under that pressure which we shouldn't give into we should would firmly describe things carefully in our uh, papers supplementary uh, section if needs be but the, the the raw diffraction images data do provide the ultimate in presenting our reproducibility uh, evidence for uh, the reader of our and, and users of our studies so in terms of the uh, agreeing what is the version of record um, then i really do commend to the biological crystallographers you know what, what I, I mentioned the chemical crystallographers are doing um, so that you know be open when you submit your study and and not only describe the workflow using detail but provide everything to the journal editor and their chosen referees with access to all your files that document your study uh, and the, the the article the coordinates the structure factors the pdb validation report um, and i would go so far as the, the to say also uh, make the DOI of the raw diffraction data available um, and um, the, the different physical archives that are available in, in United States, um, diffractiondata.org run by Planet Miner, uh, SB Data Grid, uh, uh, and, and in Europe, Zenodo, uh, the Synchrotron Facilities, ESRF, uh, pushing the envelope and, and the European Open Science Cloud coming. Um, the Japan, the PDBJ has the X-ray diffraction archive uh, led by uh, Genji Kurisu um, for uh, providing the, the raw diffraction data directly uh, with uh, their PDB depositions in, in uh, Asia. And of course, the um, CODATA uh, multiple science communities um, are all stressing this, that um, Ideally, the software source codes should also be available. Uh, whether we would consult them as referees or editor, um, you know, but I think the chance should be there to allow software source codes to be uh, looked at in, in, in and, uh, you know, if, if there's really a, a, a query uh, by the editor or the referees. Now, the, the um, question of, of accuracy and precision comes up. Um, and the dartboard analogy, I think, is, is quite a useful thing. Um, and we can have high precision. We make our measurements at, at the highest resolution possible. Um, but if we're at the wrong pH for the crystallization to study the, the enzyme function, um, then we're not hitting the bullseye. So that, that's where we want to be. And Time resolved diffraction, um, I mentioned one of mine in, in, in the early slide on ID9. We, we saw the, over time the growing electron density in the enzyme active site, and we've got the cofactor here um, and the, the uh, 
uh, electron density for the uh, ES2 intermediate, but there's obviously sufficient flexibility here that the uh, detail uh, and precision, uh, you know, is not there. But the point I'm making here with the dartboard is that we're, we're actually clearly uh, looking at the right thing because we, 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 we've got overall uh, a cluster around the bull. And that's what we're aiming at with, with the, the dartboard. And um, Lukash um, ex uh, emphasized nicely the, the um, neutron crystallography and the, the protonation state determination. And of course, the, the uh, very high resolution studies and pioneering work by Keith Wilson, Spishik Dauter, uh, marvelous stuff, certainly inspired me to really push uh, the Conk and Avalina studies, um, and that's what we were able to achieve with the data measurements. Just uh, just a few minutes left, if possible, yeah, John. That's yeah, possible. near the end, yeah. Um, uh, at the uh, the Cornell uh, synchrotron source that I, that I showed the um, uh, Sol Gruner detector earlier. So what would we say in, in conclusion, the overall strategy for our measurements is to, to answer this question, what is the structural chemistry of the limit living organism at its temperature and pressure. And in this article, um, I sort of explore the various aspects of that. And we seek accuracy. Um, individually, our methods can be precise, but if we combine them, we can really reach uh, accuracy. Um, and if we aim for the right thing, it, we're aiming at the bull and we're getting the biological uh, accuracy as, as uh, Marcus Fisher emphasized uh, in his talk. And raw data archiving really has given us fresh insights on our efforts as, as profoundly seekers after truth um, and encourages to re-examine all aspects of scientific truth, objectivity and how we report our studies. So by way of uh, acknowledgement, um, obviously Darsbury has been very important uh, to me in my career, but also the Manchester Chemistry Department and my various roles within IUCR uh, have greatly uh, broadened my horizons. I thank Rob and Dale again for, for really uh, great discussions um, over the workflow and, and avoiding the dangers of harking. Um, and within the uh, working group and the committee, uh, Lois Kroon Battenberg and Brian McMahon for discussions. Uh, and also people like Gerard Bricoin, who really pushed the envelope on uh, raw data deposition right from the outset and have, have been great uh, as a consultant uh, to the uh, working group and the committee. Uh, and uh, I thank uh, all my PhD students, postdocs, collaborators, the facilities and, and the funding agencies. And I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to uh, try and answer questions that you might have. Thanks very much, John. That was fantastic and a, a really good call to arms for complete transparency and openness in handling of data and deposition. So I'm sure we have some questions in the Slack. Um, yeah, so we have one, which is, what's the future of crystallographers after alpha fold and prediction improvement? Well, I think, um, Daniel Rigdon gave us a, a good sort of uh, tick box and crossing out of, of what um, remains to be done. And I think some of, from my IUCR newsletter articles, I wrote two of them on the impact as a game changer of, of AlphaFold 2. Um, but I think that the key ones um, are, so, so where I was wrong um, is, is that, something like metal binding sites, um, but the transferability um, that uh, Robbie Jewelston and, and colleagues have led uh, from uh, putting ligands in, including metals, is, is clearly uh, can be done. Um, but I think the, the, the conformational changes, um, and uh, you know, I just don't believe that prediction can do that. I think that the time resolved, um, and the um, different crystalline states, the different cryo AM structure determination states um, are, you know, things that we should measure. And, and as Isabel has, uh, Uzon has emphasized, you, you know, it, it, we shouldn't be just doing um, the, uh, you know, the um, reliance on prediction. Because it, it's based, I mean, philosophically, it's based within our 
current knowledge base and we'd never break further beyond uh, if, if we if we just said well you know we're not going to look at conformational changes um, that might be predicted I don't think they will uh, Gerard's got a comment which I saw popped up but I only saw half the comment uh, if you could read out, read out the yes so it says a big problem with the archiving of raw diffraction images is that it can remain quite useless until it is ensured that all the instrumental metadata are available to reproduce or even improve their processing. Has this been, in your opinion, taken seriously enough by Simpleton facilities? Right to the heart. <laughs> Great point from Gerard. Um, what, but to, to a degree, that remains to be seen um, because the, the availability from the ESRF of, of its data and, and uh, so on is really just at the outset. Um, but um, Andy Gertz, who, who was leading the charge at ESRF, he, he's a, a member of the Committee on Data and, and the working group before that. And he certainly, you know, he's taking part in our workshops. And, and if you look at the, um, the sort of uh, ESRF um, data archive as an example, um, then, I, you know, I think that's a good start. Obviously, um, the specialist archives like um, Protein data diffraction data org and SB data grid that they they are tuned in to you know our uh, methods and methodologies, whereas the synchron facility archives they're dedicated to to all their beamlines data being available, um, and there's two principles. One one is that as an investigator we can uh, give the DOI in our paper, but the funding agencies are also pushing the facilities for, for public release, release to the public after three years. And I, I, don't, I don't really agree with that. I think that as the PI, you should retain ownership of the data until you, you give up on it. Um, and that could be five years. I mean, you know, I come back to my own data set sometimes, you know, quite a long, long time beyond three year period. Um, but certainly if it's going to be the public, um, then uh, the, the metadata has to be rich. And if you compare Soleil data policy with ESRF data policy, then uh, Soleil is planning more metadata um, than um, the ESRF is at the moment. So, so Gerard's right, we, we got to push on that um, and, it, you know, the, the, the uh, everything is to play for, but th th it's been a good start. Uh, Gerard adds to his comment that if this matter was not given enough attention at the outset, the data sets accumulated over all these years may turn out to be less than useful. Well, quite. So there is another question in the Q and A by Rakesh, which says: Does neutron diffractions require different setups in detector during data collection? Yes, the detectors are, are um, specific. Uh, obviously, the neutron sensitive image plate is, is um, similar to the X-ray sensitive uh, image plate um, in, in concept. Uh, the, uh, I don't know precisely the chemical composition of, of the two, but they're not the same. Um, and for the time of flight, then there's a range of detector types that are uh, available at the different um, spallation sources. Um, and and they're, they're all, all of them quite different, totally different from the X-ray ones. I think we have one more question in Slack and then uh, we should probably finish the session because it's getting to 10 past. Uh, yeah, so another question from Slack by Elliot Nelson is, are these efforts to make MS structure solution workflows more easily archivable, depositable, given that tools such as Phoenix and CCP4 use version history and clear workflow history? Where should the burden of this effort be placed, given that the structure solution to deposition is already an ad nosim process? Yes, well, I mean, in several talks, it is um, an emphasis towards automation, uh, as usual, and, and it, it's, it, you know, in, increasingly, though, there's this worry that you don't know what's going on, on under the car bonnet or the hood, as the Americans call it. Um, and so if you can't describe it in your paper, um, then you're going to rely on the version um, of the software quite critically. Um, and 
you, you know, that's going to be a struggle to um, be sure of the reproducibility. Um, so, so that's a, a headache, I think. And, and, and in fact, Rob Nichols and, and I, and, and uh, I think Dale was in, involved in this, this um, particular discussion as well. One of the hardest workflows to record is what, what you do at the graphics. So you go back and forth, back and forth, and, and you know, can you actually keep track of all those steps? But you know the electronic notebook um, has got to have a role here, and and I think it, it would be a very good session for you know a, a future study weekend to to, to have you know the, the an update on on notebooks and uh, laboratory information systems. It's fairly dry topics, but they're important. Hey, fantastic! So thanks again to John and to the earlier speakers, and I will hand back to the organisers for some final comments. Thank you, everybody, for staying the course to the end of the day. <laughs> indeed, no, re really uh, good food for thought. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. And to all the speakers, indeed, um, it, it's amazing that uh, we've had so many talks on such closely related topics, yet every one has been different and, uh, and given us a lot to think about. Um, so we, we, we are over, so we should probably shouldn't go too much more over. It's the uh, Diamond user meeting um, in the morning, and then we crack back on with, the, uh, with our sessions, so to speak, at uh, 11 o'clock GMT. Um, and with that, I bet that everybody is up for uh, going and having some food. And in about 20 minutes is going to be the Crafty Crystallographer's social session. And of course, chat continues in Slack all the time. So um, good evening to everybody. <laughs>